Hi, this is Beatles author Mark Lewison, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show that centers on what's going on in the world of the Beatles news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, known for my syndicated program called Every Little Thing on the Beatles. And I'm joined by my co-host, the man who knows more than anybody else. If you scoured the planet, this man knows more of what's going on news-wise with the Beatles than anyone else. And that, of course, is Beatles examiner's Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Um, I'm going to have to defer that title this week because <laughs> because our guest uh, I'm going to uh, my, our guest knows a, a little more than I do, uh, actually a lot more than I do. But I go know. for it. Well, go ahead I, and introduce him. All right. <laughs> we have another special guest with us on the phone, and uh, this man is a is um, his title is culture reporter for the New York Times, and many of you know him for the articles that he's contributed through these many years in Beetle Fan. Alan Cozen, who has written a brand new book called Got That Something, and it's all about the song I Want to Hold Your Hand, and we welcome Alan Cozen to Things We Said Today. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken, and hi, Steve. Hi, Alan. (laughs) Uh, Let's start the conversation by talking about just a very basic question here. Why a book dedicated to one song? Is it really because of the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' Arrival in America, or do you think that this song in particular, I Want to Hold Your Hand, really merits that much attention? In a way, all of the above. I mean, the the anniversary was certainly the impetus, and this also is an e-book single that the Times, uh, and through Times Books and Byliner, um, has a series of, and uh, so they, they wanted me to do something about the 50th anniversary and to find a a good focus for it, you know, something that that could be written about in an e-book, which is meant to be read in a couple of hours. Mm. Um, so it can only be, in in my case, twenty five thousand words. They they did mention that that's twice as long as all the others in the series. <laughs> um, so it's more like the Hey Jude of e-books rather than the I want to hold your hand of e-books. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, I want to hold your hand. Uh, if, if you were to pick a song that would, could be used to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Beatles coming to America, that really is the one, um, because it's the one that really made the difference. She Loves You, uh, which was a huge song in February 64, wasn't a huge song when it was originally released, nor was For Me to You or Please Please Me. All those records came out on small labels and basically disappeared in the U.S. Um, They did have little pockets of popularity here and there, um, got onto some local radio charts. But but it was really I Want to Hold Your Hand that coincided at least with all of the madness starting, whether... Whether you can say that the madness started because of I Want to Hold Your Hand is a different question. Mm. Um, but, you know, people have been saying, I've been getting some arguments about this um, in the past couple of weeks since the book's been out, where people have been saying, well, if it wasn't I Want to Hold Your Hand, it would have been something. Well, you know, maybe it would have been, but it wasn't. And She Loves You was out, and it didn't do it. And For Me to You was out, and didn't do it. Please Please Me didn't do it. So it just happened to be. I want to hold your hand. Um, I don't know if I don't know if I would argue that the merits of I want to hold your hand itself make it uh, you know the song that you would focus on. But it, it also has another thing about it, which is the first thing they did on four track. Right. So in a certain way, it's a song that holds a really special place in the Beatles' history. Um, it's the first thing they did in four track. It's also the last, I think, of their old style singles. After that, the next one was Can't Buy Me Love, and it was really a different kind of song. I think they were uh, aware that they could be a little more mature in their in their songwriting outlook after I Want to Hold Your Hand. 
Um, with I Want to Hold Your Hand, they were still very conscious of this me and you business that, you know, isn't from me to you, please, please me, that kind of thing. And I think with After I Want to Hold Your Hand was such a huge success and the U.S. trip was such a huge success, I think they realized that they could go in a different direction, and they did. And I remember well back in those days that uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand was kind of like the theme um, that you heard, you know, any time anytime a song came on, and you know, a Beatles song came on the air, it was either I Want to Hold Your Hand or She Loves You. And, right. Ba- and basically, I Want to Hold Your Hand, though, was the one that got used. And I, and I found it interesting, you know, the arguments in the book about, you know, the fact that it did become the iconic song. And, you know, there were, there were a lot of things that didn't exactly make sense. I think your point, though, about the fact that it was such a new sound and, and the you know the, and what the Beatles brought to it, I think that had uh, you know that had a lot to do with it. Do you you agree with that? I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you think back to those times, "She Loves You" was pretty iconic too. But mm-hmm. of course, that was "She Loves You" in the wake of "I Want to Hold Your Hand." You know, it hadn't done it by itself. Once people sort of realized it was there and began listening to it, you know, you. You saw lots of um, Beatles memorabilia that said "Yeah, yeah, yeah" all over it. You know right. that really became a kind of a, a symbol of them. So "She Loves You" was certainly huge. Once "I Want to Hold Your Hand" was huge. Yeah, but doesn't that also invite the argument that because all the other earlier records became hits in 1964, like "Love Me Do" and "And She Loves You" and "Please Please Me," that those songs could have equally have been the song that really ignited the Beatles here in America. It's just that timing-wise, it happened to be I Want to Hold Your Hand. Yeah, it's, you know, in in certain ways, it really is a mystery. Because you can argue on one hand, as I partly do in the book, that, that I Want to Hold Your Hand became the huge hit it became because Capital had the clout to get it heard. Um, whereas VJ, which put out the earlier singles, and Swan, which put out She Loves You, were tiny labels and didn't have the power to get heard. But the fact is, Capital kind of, like, this all happened before Capital was ready to get it heard, you know? Mm-hmm. There was that whole business of Capital putting out the press release in early December saying, we're going to bring Beatlemania to America in 1964, a whole month later. And... Um, and Marsha Albert writes to, well, after hearing the Beatles on Cronkite, she writes to Carol James and says, why can't we hear this kind of music? Carol James gets his hands on a copy of I Want to Hold Your Hand, brings her in to introduce it, and his switchboard lights up, and, it, and they put it in heavy rotation, and Capital at that point tells him to stop. So, you know, mm-hmm. here it is, the start of I Want to Hold Your Hand becoming a huge thing, and you want to give Capital credit for being able to break it, and you can't because Capital is doing everything they can to put the brakes on, you know. And, and Carol James then copied it and sent it to a DJ in Chicago, and he copied it and sent it to a DJ in St. Louis, and Capital was finally forced to put the thing out early. So, um, so how it happened is kind of a mystery. I mean. Are, are either of you willing to say that it was Cronkite, really, who broke it? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to believe that, in a way. You know? No, I, I, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, I mean, because, only because the the news reports um, and even the Jack Parr thing were basically almost, they weren't really being totally serious. I mean, the Cronkite thing was a little bit, obviously, because it was a news report, but it was really more geared for toward adults looking, uh, t- trying to say, "Look what your kids are doing." Hmm. It wasn't right. really to it wasn't really to praise you know to praise the music at all because rock and roll was was really derided back in those days. It was it That's was right. I mean it was terrible you know yeah. how much yeah. how much uh, that that rock and roll was really looked down upon and it and the Beatles had a lot to do with. Getting a lot of respect, but they certainly didn't have it at that point in in '64. You know, but at least um, all well, that right. That's true. The initial publicity there did help. You know, the the time and Newsweek pieces, 
I mean, just the fact that they were even mentioned for the first time, that people heard the name the Beatles. I mean, that contributed. Right. So, you know, my argument is, and, and don't get me wrong, I love I Want to Hold Your Hand. I have a, a, a strong bond to that song, as do most first-generation fans. For 99% of us, it's the first song we ever heard by the Beatles, and it's what started the whole ball rolling, and we have such an attachment to that song, and the 45 with the picture sleeve and the capital swirl and everything that goes along with it. But I just happen to feel that a lot of those early Beatles records were extremely exciting. Just just oh, the very beginning of were. She Loves You, just to hear She Loves You. I mean, that song could have been the one just as much to me as I Want to Hold Your Hand. But don't get me wrong, they're all great songs. I agree. Except maybe Love Me Do. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine Love Me Do kind of igniting the, the, the sort of excitement. That, <laughs> nothing against Love Me Do, but of all those songs, it's probably the least exciting. Right. But one thing, one thing about your book, though, is you really don't mention um, I Saw Her Standing There very much. Which, Not much, right. Which, I, which, you know, is actually, given the lyrics of the song, she was just 17 and you know what I mean. I mean... There was a little bit of innuendo. There was a little bit of there was there was something going on with that song, and um, you know, and I thought that was. I mean, I, I was actually kind of surprised that you didn't mention it more in the book. Was there a reason for that? Um, well, probably because I had only twenty five thousand words. Or actually, I was supposed to have only twenty thousand, and I went okay. five thousand. Um, and so, you know, I also don't talk much about this boy, which is the British B side of "I Want to Hold Your Hand." And and when I started the book, I kind of thought I would. I thought I would talk about both sides of the single. But yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you. Um, for me, I saw her standing there is really the strongest thing on Please Please Me, their first album. Mm -hmm. And um, and the thing you mentioned, uh, you know, and you know what I mean, is precisely the same effect as I talk about in the section where I talk to um, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top or Moving Sidewalks, uh, where they skipped the first verse of the song in their 1968 cover and went right for yeah, you got that something for exactly the same reason. It's just innuendo. It's it's saying it and not saying it. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing as that, that line, you know what I mean. But yeah, I mean, I love I Saw Her Standing There, and um, I just felt also, it, you know, even though for us it was the B-side of I Want to Hold Your Hand and it was on with Meet the Beatles, it actually, you know, it, it's really not from the same period as I Want to Hold Your Hand. It's from... Please Please Me period, mm -hmm. um, and but, sort but of in the that. book, I talk about the Please Please Me period just sort of on the way to I Want to Hold Your Hand. Right. right. You but know. the thing is, when that single came out, we didn't know that. So, you know, true. it was just two songs at the same time, and, and some of the success of I Want to Hold Your Hand, you have to give some credit to the B-side, because it was so exciting to hear a great rocker like that. I can't say I disagree with you, and um, and not only that... You know, probably like you, I still kind of hear it, having grown up with Meet the Beatles, as being closer to the spirit of that album than to the Please Please Me album. You uh -huh. know, maybe that's maybe that's why it stands out for me so much on Please Please Me. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, I had to deal with. I suppose if I had if I had another five thousand words, maybe mm -hmm. I could have could have dealt with this question because I you know I I, I, I kind of agree with you and um, it just didn't seem to me as I was writing that that was the way I should go but I, I totally understand the point you're making and um, I, I have complete sympathy with it hmm. and that's another thing too that that um, beat the Beatles you know in America had I want to hold your hand and please please be did not in England so you know, the American audience got a whole different kind of outlook. Well, yeah, I mean, as, as I kind of point out in passing, really just in passing, Meet the Beatles, to Lennon and McCartney and even Harrison, is actually, it, it's much better to them than their own albums in England were, because with the exception of Till There Was You, there's no covers, it's all originals. Right. It, it shows us that side of the Beatles much more strongly than either of the first two British albums do. Hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love the part where you get into the covers of I Want to Hold Your Hand um, and you talk about the moving sidewalks. One cover that I was I was looking for that you didn't mention was Sparks. Have you heard the the Russell the Russell Mail cover of Sparks? No, you know, cover I really of a, a Sparks heard. cover of I Want to Hold Your Hand. I mean, uh, no, Are you going to play it on the show? No, we're not actually. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't I hadn't we hadn't play, we don't usually play music, but uh, it's a very uh-huh. slow version, very different version of I Want to Hold Your Hand. If you're familiar with Sparks, and I'm, I suspect you are. You know how different mm, sure. how different they are. They're not oh, yeah. they're not your usual type, and and they and uh, Russell Mail does this very slowly. It's a, it's a fantastic cover, actually. But see, this is the you, thing about the Beatles. There's it, there's always something else to discover, and if you and if you temporarily run out of things to discover about the Beatles themselves, there are always the way other people interpret their songs, uh, and there are so many mm-hmm. that um, you know that. You know, it covers are something I've gotten into really only recently. I mean, I've had shelves of them for years, but but never really cared that much about them because I was really interested mostly in the way the Beatles did things. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, there, there, there always have been some that I've really liked. And I thought when I was writing this book that since the book is really about sort of in a way a biography of a song – that I should deal with the song's afterlife to some degree, and the afterlife really is the covers, because the Beatles dropped it really quickly. The Beatles played it for less than a year. Right, and mm-hmm. and it, interestingly enough, back in those days, the covers of I Want to Hold Your Hand were done by very establishment people, Arthur Fiedler, for one. Right. And that gave the song a, a, a social acceptance that it probably it might not have otherwise gotten. Um, you know, in a certain way, but you know, Arthur Fiedler just loved their stuff. I mean, right. he legitimately, he always did. he always did. Yeah. yeah, I'll never forget that picture of him with the Beatle wig on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what I like most about what you put in the book, Alan, is um, the information that you give on not just "I Want to Hold Your Hand," but songs leading up to it, and the in, the invention that was used in Beatle records and certain things that I wasn't even aware of. For example, like in I Want to Hold Your Hand, the introduction of the song, the instrumental part, where they're they're using the same chords as where you hear, I can't hide, I can't hide, I can't hide. Right. That actually came from George Martin, the idea to do that. Um, apparently, you know, I mean, he was saying that at that time his specialty was was beginnings and endings. Um, whatever, whoever came up with it, it was a really interesting idea, and it was something they hadn't done before. And most people don't do with songs. You know, you either take the melody or you take uh, a, a bit of the chorus, like She Loves You. But this just comes from such a strange place to, to take an intro. Um, it really sort of catches your ear. Hmm. And also, that you know, the fact that the I can't hide, I can't hide, I can't hide, that... that saying it three times, um, which Robert Whitaker, not Robert Whitaker, Robert Freeman, um, getting the photographers mixed up here, um, <laughs> <laughs> he claimed credit for, and, and whether that was really, you know, people claim credit for things, you know, there's no way to know, um, right. but the fact is that by saying it three times, they made the, they put the bridge completely out of balance, you know, the bridge is supposed to be just typically eight bars. And by repeating it, they make it into 11 bars. So not only is the bridge, in a way, calling attention to itself because it's kind of out of um, proportion, um, and, and that builds a kind of tension. But now, as, as you point out, they've, they've taken that repetition and put it at the beginning of the song, so that puts it in your ear. You know, even if, even if you don't hear it as the chords of, I can't hide, I can't hide, I can hide, it kind of puts that little harmonic progression in your ear so that when you get there, it's it's familiar. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, you point that out in several songs where you expect there to be maybe a, a major chord and instead they use a minor chord, things like that that yeah. you bring to the table here in your book, which I really enjoy. And what kind of things can you point out that were very different from, you know, tradition in the way that, you know, songs were written that the Beatles brought to the table? even this early on? Well, they were, I think they, ex- 
experimented pretty much every time they went out. I mean, they just didn't like to repeat. They didn't like to repeat themselves, and yet they did in certain ways. You know, the the bringing of the harmonica from 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 uh, "Love Me Do" to "Please Please Me," and then to "From Me to You," and then dropping it. I thought it was interesting that when they got up to "She Loves You," they decided to make it a third person narrative. Now, it's not that you never hear that in in songs, but you hadn't heard it in their songs yet. Right. And um, and and it was a little daring in that they were at that time playing with that idea of uh, you know the me you personal thing you know here they're here they're third person and they're talking to someone else and in fact they're probably talking yeah, I mean I always pictured it as they're talking to a guy you know they're talking to a male friend well mm-hmm. they're definitely you know, and. So it's it's a little bit out of that comfort zone that they've created of, you know, from me to you. And, uh, you know, the fact that in from me to you in the bridge and also in I Want to Hold Your Hand, as, as Ken pointed out, the, uh, the switch to the, uh, to the minor key at a place where you expect it to be the major, the, do- the, the dominant minor, you know, the dominant in a, in a key is, you know, the fifth, the fifth note. And the chord built on the fifth note is usually in a, in a major key. It's a major chord, and it's one of the sort of pillars of the chord structure. So you don't expect them to suddenly switch into minor. That was another place where they kind of repeated themselves, you know. I mean, they did it in From Me to You, and they really liked it. I mean, McCartney's talked about it. Uh, he talks about it in, in the intro interview in Mark Lewison's um, recording sessions book, which I, I quote, then when they got to I Want to Hold Your Hand, they kind of did the same trick, except they added a seventh to it, which kind of ups the ante a bit. You know, I, I get into a little bit of this, you know, key business in the book, and I realize that I'm not writing for an audience of Walter Everett, you know, um, <laughs> people who are, you know, really serious music theory students. And so I try to explain what all that's about And really what it's all about and what music theory people, even if they talk about aeolian cadences and and whatever it is, they're really just talking about the effect it has on you psychologically because of what you expect. You know, you would expect things and the Beatles would do something different. And they weren't trained to do it. They weren't trained to say, hey, we can make it a little different, you know, because it's the, um, you know, relative major and relative minor and you know they didn't even know that stuff you know they were just going completely by instinct and that's one of the really great things about them you know you've got these untutored guys who were just so musical that they could create an incredible emotional effect you know that business of of extending the bridge to 11 bars by adding a couple of repetitions of i can't hide i mean it's brilliant you can't imagine the song without the three repetitions. It just doesn't really work, you know? Right. And whether Robert Freeman came up with it or not, I mean, they had to say, okay, do we do this or do we not? Yeah, it works. Why does it work? It works because it puts off the return to the regular verse and the key progression of the regular verse. And it works because it's taking this idea, you know, uh, my love is so great, I can't hide it, and and repeating it three times, making it urgent, not just, not just you know, a statement. <laughs> so I don't know this. I, all of this stuff, uh, I don't know that they consciously thought about. You know, sat down and said, "Well, this is why we're doing it, and, and this is why it works." But it worked, and they recognized that it worked, and George Martin recognized that it worked, and was able to sort of you know, help them point up the things that worked. You know, that idea of, in I talk a little bit about the four tracks, um, mm-hmm. and on the fourth track, which was their overdub track, you hear them every time they get to the end of the verse where they sing, I want to hold your hand, and they have that octave leap up to the falsetto. You know, I want to hold your hand. They double just the falsetto top note. You know, so you listen to that fourth track, and you you hear... Hand, hand. <laughs> you know, every time the verse comes around, plus the hand clapping and and some other things, uh, the, the extra bass line and 
stuff like that. And that really gives you a sense of, you know, and, and a lot of that is George Martin. I mean, he would have, at that point, known more than they did about how the studio can be used to make a recording stronger. And the idea of doubling that, false, that falsetto uh, really is brilliant. If you go back to the vocal track and listen to it, it it's not like that falsetto is weak. It really didn't need the, the doubling. But the fact that, um, that they did it, I think, uh, just shows sort of how they worked. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just brilliant. Did oh. you see any, since you've written so much about classical music, did you see any classical strings, um, um, I mean, links uh, to them at this early point? Is there, any, mm -hmm. is there any kind of classical, you know, any kind of, any of that, can, can you, can you, Say that you you know that you saw that kind of seriousness at this point, or is it still is it still too early to to get to be there? If you if you see what I'm getting at, yeah, I think it's still too early. I mean, you know, they had it in their backgrounds. With you know, they didn't. It wasn't what they overtly loved, and it wasn't what they talked about much. But I mean, if you keep in mind, I'm sure you've you, you know you've both read Mark's book and uh, mm -hmm. Mark Lewison's book. And he talks about the stuff they listened to on the radio when they were kids. And, you know, they came from a, a world different than even we grew up in. You know, they listened to British Music Hall and, and they heard light classics and things like that. They, they kind of knew what was out there. And even if they took some classical influences, they're not um, so overt that you can tell. Except, of course, you know, Robert Freeman's argument is that he was playing John Lennon some, um, some French avant-garde stuff. And the avant-garde group he was playing that was into repetition, and that's where they got the idea for I Can't Hide. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it would be a stretch, but maybe there's some classical influence there. Um, but otherwise, I, I, I can't really say I hear anything that I would attribute to a classical influence directly. Alan, I'm, I'm not going to get technical here on this issue, but you do bring up the point that a lot of this early music, the Beatles were using chords like major and minor sevenths, and even at the end of She Loves You, there's a major sixth. And that, that ending right. of She Loves You is so unique for that reason, I think. But yeah. were pop groups doing this at all before the Beatles? W weren't those chords usually something that you'd find more in jazz? Uh, they definitely were things you would find more in jazz, and I think, I think the impetus here is George Harrison. George Harrison was really interested in learning more and more chords. Um, McCartney was too, but uh, but Harrison especially. And you know, I think we know that the sixth was his idea, uh, the sixth, and she loves you. And if you go back to, you listen to her around the same time as I Want to Hold Your Hand, listen to All I've Got to Do mm. on With the Beatles, or for us, Meet the Beatles, um, you know, that very first chord is a jazz chord. And you just get the idea that this is George trying to explore that world, and he's also trying to explore it kind of against the grain, because Lennon was really anti-jazz. He just didn't like all that, and those weren't the kind of chords he wanted to play. So you you hear George really pushing in those days, and and that was an influence that he was taking, and it was really pr particularly strong at that time. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Steve, just um, here's a a point to to clip out. Alan, I just noticed the in the bibliography the the reference to the article about Sid. Uh, Bernstein's death. It's right. uh, 2003 um, on the on the year. It says 2003. Um, mm -hmm. As opposed to 13. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. Something. I will note that. <laughs> in case I'm looking. At, I'm looking at it right now. It says Sid Bernstein, who helped import the Beatles, dies at 95. New York Times, August 21st, 2003. Mm. I noticed that this afternoon as I was going through it, and I love the fact that you. Um, had the the links to the the Beatle biographies that they gave to the newspapers in '64, mm -hmm. um, because I remember delivering those when I was <laughs> back then, and because um, uh, I wasn't in New York though, I was in in the in uh, the Boston area, and I remember uh -huh. 
I think it was the Boston Record American had those on their front page, had the uh, the promos for those things on their front page. Uh, they mm-hmm. ran them separately four days in a row, I think, as I recall. Yeah. You know, um, one there was uh, one time, I, I can't remember exactly when it was, it might have been about 1990 or 89. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent the period around Christmas time working at the Times, really, I, for some reason, I was there very late at night. Well, I used to go there after concerts a lot, when I was back when I was reviewing concerts. Mm-hmm. And I used to go into the morgue, which, if your listeners don't know, is what we call the, 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 the cuttings library in a newspaper. And I got out all of the Beatles stuff they had, and I photocopied it at <laughs> home. Right. And they had stuff that was uh, not just New York Times. I mean, they had stuff from the Journal America and the Daily News and New York Post, all those Nora Ephron articles that I wow. mentioned I got from that file. And then I, I spread out, you know, I got George Martin, I got Yoko, I got, you know, and I just sort of photocopied everything that the Times had and, and then put them all in chronological order. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so that that was, um, you know, looking at that period, that 1964 period was really something. And, and I was struck um, by the fact that the Times covered it so thoroughly. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had, I mean, it, on on one hand, it's kind of, funny writing, because you, you see the, the TV critic, um, whose name was Jack Gould, referring to the Jack Parr show and saying, well, you know, they played a song apparently called You Know You Should Be Bad, <laughs> you know, which is obviously sort of She Loves You. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but, you know, we had an article about, you know, the psychology of it, and an article about the sociology of it, an article about the music, and, you know, they really went to town covering this. And mm-hmm. I was really kind of happy to see that, you know, because I always thought that um, the Times Beatles desk was invented when I decided to take it over. But obviously, I had predecessors. <laughs> mm. Well, at least the Times did a, a good job on it because so many other newspapers didn't treat it very seriously. And you can, yeah. you know, if you see some of those cli- uh, the few clip collections floating around, um, yeah. it's it's you know very nice to see that that the Times. I mean, the Times has always been, you know, a cut above everybody else anyway. And but what was back- surprising? What was surprising for me? I mean, and and disappointing as a researcher, mm-hmm. uh, and particularly for this book, was that I really wanted to know when the last time they played "I Want to Hold Your Hand" was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know that after they got back to England and did that fall tour in '64, they were no longer playing any of the early songs. So I want to hold your hand was dropped. So the last time they could possibly have played it was September 20th, 1964, at the Paramount Theater in New York, which is right around the corner from the Times building. <laughs> and the the Times had Gay Talese write about it. Gay Talese is now you know a legendary name, right? Um, but he apparently wasn't that into this. I mean, he didn't mention a single song they played. He only mentioned that they played 10 of them. And I, I really wish I could have established whether or not they played it at that show, but mm-hmm. I couldn't. You mm-hmm. know? Um, there were just no reports giving their set list. And, That's uh, not I even hope to find it one day, you know, because I'd, I'd like to expand this book and make it into something bigger at some point. I don't know if that will ever be possible, but... Um, you know, if I do, there are lots of things I can do, like get to the bottom of that and change the date of Sid Bernstein's obituary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which I wrote. Aha. Uh, uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know. There's a couple things um, I, I want to bring up uh, from the book, Alan. This this is real minutia, I guess, for some people. But you do say here that there was talk, albeit briefly, of letting George Harrison in on the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership. Right. I never heard that before. Where did you find that out? Actually, McCartney has talked about it. Really? Yeah, huh. and um, and he he's raised it and deflected it by saying, but, you know, George wasn't that interested in writing in those days. He's talked about it actually fairly recently. I, I, can't, I can't remember exactly which interviews, because... In the last few months, he's given so many. It, it, it's, if you look at, at some of those interviews he did 
about the new album. I think there is some in there. I've also heard this from Mark Lewison, who's, um, uh, I'm not sure entirely what his source was, but it, it has been out and about. The question actually is whether George Harrison ever knew it. Right. <laughs> you know, because, um, in fact, you know, actually Mark may even have something about that in his book when they're talking about the, the beginning of the, the partnership and signing with uh, Dick James. I'll have to look again. I think it may have yeah, been I'll have, I, okay. I, Yeah, uh, that's something that, uh, worth looking up. The, the other uh, thing, I was going to ask you, I, I know you've interviewed, you've interviewed all of them, correct? Um, I never interviewed John. Okay. Um, right as I was getting to the point in my career when that would have been possible, we know what happened. Right. And George, I've met, but I never interviewed him either. Um, okay. I met him when I was over there to do interviews for the anthology. And mm-hmm. He had he had taken the position that Paul and Ringo should talk about it, and he didn't want to, so... I basically, you know, said hello, and that was about it, and I decided to respect his feeling that um, that it isn't what he wanted to talk about. So we never did an interview, which I really regret. Mm. But you have interviewed, all right, so you've interviewed Paul and Ringo. You've also talked to Yoko. Um, I've talked to Olivia. <laughs> you've talked to Olivia. All the, is there a story of all the with all the interviews you've done that you could relate about, you know, about interviewing them, or is there anything... Um, in general, you want to, you would say about about your encounters with them. They have been, you know, fabulous uh, times, you know, because you know you're, you're obviously, given that you know the degree to which I'm into this, you know, you're obviously going to be very nervous going to one of those interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, both Paul and Ringo, who I've interviewed each handful of times, really make you comfortable, particularly Paul. Paul has a way, I mean, he is the most professional interviewee ever, you know, and I've interviewed hundreds of people in, you know, in, in different fields of music. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he makes you feel as if you are pals, and he just wants to hang out with you and talk for a while. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and also he remembers you, you know. I mean, I, I interviewed him first in October 1990, um, and then... About a year later, he came to New York and did a press conference uh, at Carnegie Hall, or actually at Weill Hall, which is part of Carnegie, because he was going to do his oratorio in New York. And I had gone to England and reviewed the premiere of the oratorio in Liverpool, but I didn't see him at that point. I, the last time I saw him was the previous October, and this was during the summer. Then he came the next October to New York. He saw me in the audience of the press conference, and he asked Carnegie Hall's people to bring me around to have a chat with him because he uh, I, he just wanted to thank me for the review, which people don't normally do. But in this case, you know, he said, you know, a lot of people were very snide about it, and you gave it a chance. And Linda's father, who died not long after the oratorio was a big New York Times reader, and he called me up and read me the review over the phone, and it really meant a lot to him, so I just wanted to say thanks. I thought that was a really nice thing to do. He didn't have to do that, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and we've talked since, and, uh, you know, he always is, is very friendly and forthcoming. You, you, you do have to, as, as I'm sure you know, you do have to find questions that are ones he hasn't answered before, or else he'll tell you that he dreamed yesterday if given half a chance. Right. Um, <laughs> Ringo is a little less forthcoming, um, but he can be fun too, you know. With Ringo, you know, where the ice gets broken is if you, if you ask him some historical Beatles questions. I wanted to know, for instance, about Four Nights in Moscow. I'm sure you know that the name mm-hmm. of that track, and no one knows mm-hmm. quite what it is. It may be early 1970. And there is a session sheet from Abbey Road that says Four Nights in Moscow. I think it lists, I can't remember, I don't have it in front of me, it lists either John or George as producer of it. Mm-hmm. And it gives the session dates and the takes, 
and it says that I think Lenin took a copy home. And I asked Ringo about it, and he said, you know, what did tell me about Four Nights in Moscow? And he said, oh, you know, you've read someone's book. And I said, no, I've read this, and I showed him the sheet. Once you show him the evidence that, you know, that you're not just quoting another book, that you've got, you know, something here that he needs to focus on, he gets a lot more friendly about it. I mean, he didn't know. He just he said, I've got no idea what this is. And the other thing was playing him the cavern rehearsal tape. I enjoyed doing that. Hmm. Um, at the time, I mean, we now know that that was basically from October 62. Right. Um, because, because I Want to Hold Your Hand was written about October. Mm-hmm. Um, so it couldn't be earlier. But at the time that tape leaked out, nobody knew exactly when it was from. Um, and nobody knew for sure whether it was Pete Best or Ringo playing. And I, I knew this was going to be tough to do. So I, I for some, somehow managed to get into the room where I was going to interview him before he did. And there was a cassette machine there. And I put the tape in the cassette machine, all queued up and ready to go. Mm-hmm. And um, we did the interview about, you know, whatever his, uh, his current album, I think it might have been Time Takes Time or, or one of those, or Vertical Man. And then at the end, I had a couple of Beatles questions that you can ask before he gets bored of the Beatles questions and throws you out. Um, <laughs> and I said, listen, there's this tape. And it's, a, it's got one after 909, Cat's Walk, and I want to hold your hand. Uh, I'm sorry, I saw her standing there on it. And he said, well, is it us? And I said, yeah, it's definitely you. And he said, is it me? Because he said, I don't remember doing one after 909 much before Let It Be. And I thought, well, uh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> they did it in the studio in 63, but okay. You know, I, I said, yeah, you know, you, it's, it's definitely the Beatles. Whether it's you is what I want to ask you. And he said, okay, well, you know, if it's going just like, it could be Pete, but if it's cool, it's me. <laughs> I said, okay, well, <laughs> let's play it, you know, and I put it on. And he listened to a bit of, of um, I saw her standing there, maybe a minute of it, and he said, yeah, that's me. And, you know, even though we later didn't need that information because it was from October, it had to be him, um, I, I was really very happy with that moment, establishing the, the chronology to some degree of that tape, that it wasn't Pete. Mm-hmm. Um, and because uh, I couldn't tell for sure. I mean, the drumming on that, I think he was feeling his way on some of those songs. It wasn't yet the, uh, the Ringo-type drumming that, that you know, we know from the records. Um, so I, I thought it could have gone either way, but he recognized himself and, and said it was. And uh, and I used to actually, um, every time I went to interview him, I would bring him a tape of outtakes. And uh, until I think the third or fourth time when I, I just, you know, didn't have anything else to bring him really. And uh, so I, I said at the end of the interview, you know, usually I bring you a tape. And he said, yeah, 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 what do you got? And I said, well, I was thinking this time you'd bring me one. <laughs> and he said, yeah, keep dreaming. <laughs> so, yeah, so the interviews were great. I mean, I, I really enjoyed talking to them. And also George Martin, you know, I've interviewed him a bunch of times. And even though um, you sometimes can't get him to get the chronology about, you know, Andy White and Ringo Wright and and all of that, I mean, he has his version of it. and. And even though it's correct in the last of his books, I mean, he still tells it the other way. But you know what? In a way, who cares? He's George Martin. <laughs> you know, right. he right. has he he still has a lot to say, and um, you know, he's a, he's he's just a very remarkable guy. And and to be able to talk to him for an hour or an hour and a half is just such a privilege. You know, when you're talking to Ringo, do you get the sense that? You really got to lay off the Beatle questions or really keep it to a minimum? Because I, I do kind of get that impression with him. He really wants to talk about his solo music and his current project. So yeah. I guess, you, like you said, you have to wait till the end of the interview before you can lay those questions on him. That's basically it. I, I wait until the end, and I try to make it not just, you know, what was it like in those days. I like to, you know, bring a tape or a recording sheet or just something that all of us have questions about that only they can answer. 
you know, and you get into a room with them so infrequently that I like to use, you know, those few minutes for that. Paul's much more open about talking about the Beatles, you know. I mean, if you listen to the the recent Howard Stern interview that he did, that was a 45-minute interview, and the first 43 minutes were about the Beatles, and the right. last two minutes were about his new album. Right. And that was astounding. That was pretty yeah, amazing. I was amazed. He was very <laughs> gracious about that. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, when I go in, I, I try to talk about the things that they want to talk about. I mean, also just because... As a journalist, you know, if I go interview Paul now, I'm going there to find out what he has to say now about what he's doing now. And if I can get some Beatles stuff in later, that's great. Right. But, you know, I'm really here to talk about what he's doing. So right. um, Howard Stern doesn't have that problem. You know, he's not a newspaper. Uh, so, yeah, you know, yeah, Ringo is, is less open to it than Paul, but but he'll do it for a few minutes and... And then that's, you know, that's enough. But, um, you know, I mean, sometimes he brings it up, too. He brought up the fact that, um, you know, I I asked him, (laughs) the first interview with him, I asked him if he remembered what his contribution to What Goes On was. Because it was very unusual. I mean, that was a song that was Lennon McCartney's Starkey. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what his contribution was, and I wanted to know. So I asked, and he said, oh, you know, the boys were just being generous that day. And and then he started reminiscing about other things, and he he told me, and this was before it turned up in the Sgt. Pepper special uh, subsequently, he said, yeah, you know, they, they they would come to me with things that I just couldn't sing. Like, you know, what would you do if I sang out of tune? Would you throw tomatoes at me? And people were already throwing stuff at us. <laughs> you know, I couldn't <laughs> sing that, so I refused. You know, that wasn't something I asked about. He just came up with it, and, uh, you know, that was something I'd never heard before. Um, but so, about, uh, about what goes on, he did say in a press conference that he wrote about five words. Really? He did <laughs> say that in one of the well, Beatles press conferences, and still to this day we don't know what those five words are, <laughs> or if he just made that up on the spot. Yeah. We don't really know. Hmm. I got two more things to ask. I wanted to ask, number one, about interviewing Yoko. I mean, when I found when I interviewed her the first time, she was charming as heck. Second time, she was a little more businesslike. And then I was also going to ask, what do you think is coming as far as Beatle releases go, Helen? Hmm. Okay. About interviewing Yoko, um, I've always found her very charming. You know, I don't don't see that um, supposed dragon lady when I go talk to her. I mean, she's Mm -hmm. She's girlish. I mean, she giggles. Yeah, <laughs> you know, she, do, she does. She, she definitely does. <laughs> you know, and she's also, you know, a little bit spacey, as you might expect. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know. I've I found her very interesting to talk to. I've interviewed her at least three or four times, um, plus one publicly, which was also fun because it, it, it was a public interview the New York Times arranged. Um, so there was obviously an audience, and there were people asking questions at the end. And um, but you know, sometimes it, I think it, the funniest part of that one was um, someone asked her about cut piece. Do you remember cut piece? It was oh, when yeah. she, you know, people would cut bits of her clothes off, and mm-hmm. and she said, uh, well, you know, and in those days I didn't have very many good clothes, and I always insisted on wearing the best clothes I had for that piece, and so I, I I really didn't have very much, and so you know when they would cut those up, that was it, and I don't know what possessed me. I said, so that's why you did the two virgins cover, <laughs> and she said, Helen, you know, like she was my mother, <laughs> you know. I just thought that was kind of funny. But, mm-hmm. I mean, I've always found her, you know, she answers the question. She's, um, I don't know if I would describe it as businesslike, but you don't really have to ask two or three times. And, you know, she knows what you want to hear, you know, what you want to hear about, and, and she will focus on that. Um, and we'll go off in some sort of idealistic, um, idealistically spacey things sometimes. But she'll get back to the business at hand as well. I, I found her always very very friendly and forthcoming. Keep in mind, of course, you know, I'm interviewing all these people for the New York Times, and people tend to be very nice to us. Mm. Right. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So, um, and about what's coming, um, you know, it's always hard to say. I, 
I believe from the scuttlebutt I've heard that we're going to see a video box of some concerts, perhaps. Mm. Okay. You know, there are a lot of full concerts that Apple has the rights to. Right. Uh, Shea Stadium, the Tokyo concert, which they've already put out in Japan. There is the Washington Coliseum concert, which they've already put out on iTunes, and it would be really nice to have that on a a Blu-ray DVD. That was the best quality Um, I've ever seen of that. Yeah. yeah, It it really is, and you know what? I mean, because the quality was so good, maybe, having watched that show a million times, I watched it far more closely when they put it out this time, and that is one hell of a performance. Mm -hmm. It is. You know, for each one of them, and Ringo in, in particular, in a way, I mean, he's really drumming there. And uh, But right. all of it, it's just great. So they could put, if they were to put that and, and Tokyo out, they would be putting out stuff in a way that they've already put out. Um, so then they'd have a choice for 65 of either Shea or they also own the Paris 65 concert. Oh, um, really? I wasn't aware that they had that. Oh, yeah, because remember that when um, one of the anthologies came out, they used the clip from it as one oh, that's of the right, that's uh, right. promos. Mm-hmm. Um, and also they have, I believe they have drop-in. Um, mm-hmm. So they really could put out a box set that goes from 63 to 66 with a live performance from every year. That would be kind of nice. And well, what I'm hearing is that they're thinking about that. Um, I've heard that there's thinking seriously of finally bringing out Let It Be, but but you hear that all the time. Yeah, that's been that's been um, running around for quite a while. Yeah, you know the thing about Apple is that it's it's pretty airtight in terms of um You've noticed, you know, huh? <laughs> yeah, about what can get out of there in terms of, you know, plans, you know, until until they're ready to announce it. Um mm-hmm. Even if you can collar one of their workers, you know, this is like, I can't even be seen with you. you know? <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, I, I know that very well. Yes, so why why would Paul and Ringo each say that Let It Be will be coming out unless they have plans for it? Maybe they want it out, but when it finally comes down to it, Olivia or Yoko might veto it. Because they have you know, to have all four votes. They've been they've been working on this for so long. I mean, they did interviews, extensive interviews with Neil Aspinall, to be part of the extra material. And in fact, I'm told that they actually were able to ne- interview Neil Aspinall without a hat for the first time ever. <laughs> um, he he sat for these interviews, you know, in, as his plain self. So they've got all this material, and at various times, different people have not wanted it out. For a while, Paul was not happy with it. Um, I'm happy to hear that, that he's saying that it, that it will come out. Is it true that George but, didn't want it out? Um, I really don't know. Um, That's what's been rumored you, through the years. Yeah, it, it's possible. You know, I think George didn't like things out that showed the discontent. Um, He didn't like things out that showed what he considered self-indulgence, which is why he edited You Know My Name, Look Up the Number, and why he vetoed Carnival of Light. Mm -hmm. Um, He just felt that the full versions of these things were self-indulgent and they had to be trimmed. But it was me. He also vetoed now and then, too? I don't know. Uh, That I don't know. That's That's been the scuttle for quite a while that he was the reason that didn't come out. Yeah, I mean, all all I've ever heard about why it didn't come out is that they were having trouble removing that buzz. The buzz. That that runs through it. Mm -hmm. But I believe I've heard versions of it where the buzz is pretty eradicated. Right. But George Harrison is the reason why Carnival of Light didn't come out? Apparently. That's that's what I've heard. Hmm. And they couldn't compromise on an edited version? I don't know. You know, there there is, I mean, Paul McCartney has used it as a soundtrack of one of those photo films that he made with Linda's pictures. Mm. Right. Um, and so you would think, theoretically, he could negotiate a way to put it out himself. But it hasn't happened. And uh, I, I really wish it would. I'd love to hear it. Really? Because I'm, I'm on the other side of that. I really don't care if I hear it. 
you know, keep in mind that my other life has been in classical music and right. new classical music. Right. And so what I've what I've always felt that that EMI, well, EMI no longer exactly exists, but uh, now that Universal has it, and Universal has a huge classical department as well, what what they should do is get now Deutsche Grammophon, their classical line, to put out you know the Beatles avant garde album with Carnival of Light, Revolution Number no. Nine. Um, there's that drum piece that was done after Carnival of Light that I don't think really has a title. Perhaps the unedited You Know My Name, look up the number, and put it out as a classical avant-garde album. <laughs> How about so, uh, the full version of Helter Skelter? Well, that would still be on a rock album, probably. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, think they should, I think they should do that. I'd love to hear that. Too. You know, there's so many things all of us would love to hear. Right. Um, right. I do hope that we live to hear them. Uh, uh, agreed. <laughs> do you know anything about... I hope um, we, we all live to hear all those things and read the final volume of Mark Lewis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there we fun. go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Do you know anything about um, what we've been hearing about possibly the, the capital, the American Capital catalog being reissued again as single albums and through Revolver? Um, I haven't heard anything about that. They are listed in in uh, Amazon Co. UK. Yeah, but um, but the the publisher information looked a little like gray market to me. Although someone said they looked into it and found that it was somehow connected with Universal, so I, I really don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I was I initially felt like it was gray market, and then I looked into it a little more, and those publishers are are the same thing. Apparently the generic things they use for Universal stuff because it was really? used for the Eric Clapton box set that just came out. Oh. So it's well, very... Yeah. I, I'm not saying that's an absolute... I mean, I'm still kind of on the, on the you know, on the borderline. I'm just kind of, you know, but um, I think it's... Yeah. it's because yeah. of the 50th anniversary, I think uh, that may be what they're doing. You yeah, know? I wouldn't be against it. I mean, I really think that having started the series, they should finish it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it just doesn't make sense to leave it dangling like that. Right, right. I agree. All right, so we have to wrap things up. And Alan, you've been you know a tremendous guest here. The new book, once again, is called "Got That Something." It's available as an ebook. And anytime you want to join us, come right back. Okay, I'd love to. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been Thank great. you both. All right, that's been great having Alan Cozen. As our guest on the show, this time out, I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today. Thanking you so much for joining us, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, and thanking Alan Cozen for being our guest. And we will see you next time.